welcome. My name is Eric Koss. I am a consultant with Safe Church Ministry, and we are so glad uh, that you are with us today and that we're able to go back to the basics of Safe Church. And so that's what 2022 is all about for us as we continue to try to equip congregations and abuse awareness, uh, prevention, and response. And so the the five ways that we have to make a church safer are um, assessing risk. And that's the topic of this first webinar. And the second webinar will be focused on making and revising policy. The third on training and screening leaders. The fourth on being restorative um, as a congregation. And the fifth is responding with compassion and justice. Um, and so we're so glad we're here. All of these webinars will be recorded and they will be available through our YouTube channel. And uh, feel free to like or subscribe our channel when you have the opportunity. And, uh, and we're so glad to be here. I'm going to turn it over to Becky and she's going to introduce, introduce our panelists for today. Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here. So as Eric said, um, I'm Becky. I work for Safe Church as well, and I'm a volunteer and communication specialist for Safe Church. And I wanted to introduce our uh, three panelists for today. So the first one, uh, many of you are familiar with, she's their director, and then a big cousin. And uh, before coming to the role, Amanda served as professor of Old Testament at Calvin Theological Seminary. Uh, she also taught, taught at the University of Dubuque in Iowa. Uh, and then was a campus minister as well for in University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And specifically with her roles within Safe Church, um, she does the consultations, um, so provides assistance and support in situations of abuse and allegations that arise. Uh, she works uh, on abuse of power, so she de she's developing training and conducting seminars on abuse of power and working on uh, cultivation of healthy Christian communities that resist abuse. And as well, she's also working on the advisory panel process. So working with Safe Church coordinators um, on that as well. Then I wanted to turn it over to, we also have Reverend Sean Baker, who is pastor church resources for the CRC. So his roles, um, consultation, he provides assistance to pastors and churches in times of transition, crisis and discernment. Um, crossroads discernment, providing leadership and support for crossroads discernment process. Uh, challenging conversations, supporting churches seeking to engage challenging and controversial issues, and also learning events. So conducting seminars and training events for pastors and church leaders. And finally, I wanted to introduce Tara Bohr, who's the professor of social work at Dort University. So her research interests include understanding how the various systems interact with children after sexual abuse disclosures, such as child welfare, forensic team therapy, and their impact on their, their ability to uh, for the children to heal. She also has a special interest in neurobiology and its uses and applications in social work and clinical practice. Uh, Tara is a licensed independent social worker. She's trained in motivational interviews, parent-child interaction therapy, and trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Tara teaches fundamentals of social work, so, um, sociology, diversity, and inequality, vulnerability population, juvenile justice, victimology. She has many areas that she's um, that she teaches in. So it's fantastic to have her. And Tara is married and she has four young children. So welcome Tara, Sean and Amanda to our as our panelists today. Thank you so much. Mm, thanks for having us. And thanks Becky for introducing them. And Becky will be on the tech side of things today and she is our communications and volunteer specialist. Um, so we have a lot packed in for this webinar and uh, on assessing risk. And we're going to work through several scenarios that are hypothetical, um, yet so many similar situations have come up in congregations in the Christian Reformed Church and in so many other churches as well. And so we're hoping that we can learn together as we discuss some of these situations and scenarios. And then we will be introducing our assessment tool, which can be used by congregations. Um, and so I just wanted to share a little bit um, about what we hope to do as we assess the risk and prevent um, something from happening before we are suddenly in it and dealing with it. And then we realize, I wish I would have known this before this happened. Um, and so metaphors only go so far, but recently I had our hot water heater break and I didn't realize why. Uh, and then I did. 
it was the reason was because I put a pressure regulator on our whole house water supply because the pressure was so high in our house. Um, it was around 90 PSI and I thought, oh, this is going to break all of our faucets in our house. I have to reduce the pressure. So I went and did that and our pressure was great. And that was about a year ago. And then our hot water heater broke. And I wondered why did that break? And the reason was because before I put that regulator on all of the pressure that built up in our water supply system was able to go back out into the road. Um, so our hot water heater would heat up, build up pressure, and that excess pressure would be released into the water supply um, that was coming into our house. And once I put that regulator on, none of that extra pressure could be released. And so it was stuck in the system. It was exerting a lot of pressure in the hot water heater and then it broke. And uh, I wanted to make sure uh, that, you know, a little hot, um, a little water in the basement is one thing. Um, but in our systems as churches, in our communities, we are always doing something to serve God, to serve people, and to hopefully be people who can share the kingdom of God and the gospel. Um, however, some things add risks to our ministry and pressure can be built up in our churches and institutions. And so how can we learn from some of the mistakes? How can we release some of the pressure? And um, I ended up putting on an expansion tank. And so anytime the hot water heater would build up pressure, it just takes on the pressure. And it was able to, now I'm able to avert the excess pressure in my water supply. And so hopefully we can learn today together about some things we can do to avert some of the pressure that's building within our communities and some of the risks that we are facing as congregations. Um, and so with that being said, we're going to jump into the first situation. I'm going to share my screen, um, which is a Google slide. This first situation um, was about Joyce and um, Joyce joined Every Town CRC after a challenging season in life. As a 38 year old single woman, she was excited to find a church that was ex that was not exclusively focused on families with kids. After a year of attending the church, she, had jo she joined the art team and felt more connected than ever. The church prided itself on creating vibrant worship through the arts, and they had recently hired an art director to lead the team dedicated to worship art. Soon this worship art director who was married invited Joyce to one-to-one -to -one meetings so they could work together on some ambitious projects. He loved to create spaces where others could be themselves and would emphasize that it was okay to be vulnerable. After she and he were vulnerable with one another about the challenges in their romantic lives, they soon exchanged compliments and an affair began which lasted for about a year. They cared deeply for one another even though they knew their relationship was wrong. Eventually the art, art director began to completely ignore Joyce and she didn't know what to do. So finally she told one of the pastors. Um, so we're going to work through some questions um, and I'll turn it over to Tara and Sean and Amanda. Um, and if you have any questions that come up in the middle of these situations that you have, feel free to put them in the, ch in the chat. We don't know um, how much we'll be able to answer all of them, but it would be great to have conversation in that space as well. So first, uh, what happened? Uh, what dynamics of power were, were in these situations? Yeah, I think at first glance, when people read it, they would maybe assume that these are two you know, consenting adults engaging in, well, one in an affair, um, right? But I think, um, he has power in this situation and maybe even doesn't see himself as having power and, and she is vulnerable and maybe doesn't see herself as being vulnerable, um, given, you know, the context of where they're coming from and the, the positions where they're residing in the church. Um, and his power is kind of manifested through his ability to ignore her later on. Um, I just kind of caught that reading through the second time, how he ignored her, um, really kind of established um, the power and then, you know, kind of silenced her and all of that too. Yeah, I think that's really key. One of the things I've appreciated just even since I started in ministry till now is I think we are a lot more uh, aware of power dynamics. Uh, and so the, the excuse here is getting smaller, 
I think um, a generation ago, you would have just dismissed this, like Tara said, as just, well, they're two consenting adults. Um, but I think we're aware now he's, he's in a leadership position. Uh, and so there are unique responsibilities that come with that. And uh, he was really naive about those boundaries, took advantage of them. Uh, one thing I did want to say positively, <laughs> just in the work I, I do is um, it's great to hear about a church where like a, a 30 something female feels like she can be a part and her gifts are included uh, and where there's even a vibrant arts ministry. So uh, I don't want to take a focus away from the the abuse dynamics, but that's really great to see. Uh, and in some ways for her, it probably felt like a fresh breath of fresh air to be able to enter a church that welcomed her. And she didn't see that there was a, there was a real gap in how they were paying attention to the, the power structures that she was, she was really in a way stepping into a, a trap situation. Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate what you said, uh, Sean, just about noting that there's something beautiful about uh, the fact that this 38 year old single woman would feel comfortable there, but that's actually what makes her even more vulnerable in this scenario. And um, when you have a situation where there's an imbalance of power and the imbalance of power resides in the fact that the church has given this art lead um, authority and um, responsibility. And so he has the, weight of the church behind him. And so the woman comes in assuming that he is a person that she can trust, that he is a person who is God of godly character. And so, so she allows all her defense mechanisms to, to, to go down. And so that when you have that kind of imbalance of power, it really complicates issues of consent. And so that's what we've got here is um, there's no way that she could genuinely consent to a relationship where um, she she uh, is engaging in this relationship with this person as someone who is part of the congregation and he is part of the leadership. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, he clearly crossed a boundary that it was his responsibility to maintain. Right. And I keep thinking about if you know, the church had very clear boundaries and rules um, and policies around meetings like these, then maybe, you know, neither of them would have been drawn into the relationship like it had been because they couldn't, right? They wouldn't have been able to be alone together in those contexts. And, um, you know, and I think those protections should be in place because, yeah, we are all human, right? And so um, that's why we do that so that we can, you know, ensure that um, we can keep our eyes focused on the Lord as we continue to, you know, do service with each other. I think one of the things that like leaps out at me is, is this was somewhat predictable. Uh, and there were a number of steps along the way where, uh, either, um, the, the worship leader, the art director, or the art director, supervisor, the council, somebody should have identified, wow, like his sort of mode is to create these intimate, vulnerable spaces. Um, come on. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with vulnerability. You, you want to encourage that, but within proper boundaries. And it seems like nobody anticipated that need, despite the fact that that seems to be his very signature as a leader. Uh, and so you created a situation where you, you could have known you were playing with fire if either you as the art director had a, a better sense of yourself or your supervisor was aware of your mode of leadership. Um, those are two enormous gaps that could have been anticipated. Yes, well said. Yeah, and I think more and more we're realizing um, it's really important for us as churches to put in place measures that sort of prevent situations like this from being able to move from um, kind of a, um, a, a, an occasional one-on-one -on -one meeting to a to an a, to a regular <laughs> meeting with with a full-blown affair right um and and so one of the things we're recommending actually is that in the safe church policy that churches include some kind of um, log mechanism by which 
when a staff person meets with a member of the congregation one-on-one, -on -one, that those meetings get logged um, and that they become available either to the safe church um, leader or representative in the congregation or the council, but that the, those logs could be made um, available when there are questions that arise particularly so that we can, you know, the, those in leadership can begin to see the patterns of behavior and do a kind of early intervention on situations like this. So I think, you know, if, if a council had seen, for instance, that this art director was meeting with Joyce regularly um, and, and had to, you know, that art director had to log in times and um, the times that they were meeting they would begin to see, oh, this might be getting to be a problem and we need to intervene. Yeah. And if he was choosing to lie about his meetings then we would also know that that was a problem, right? Yeah. 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 yeah I can't help thinking also about, you know, this situation being hypothetical, but so many similar situations, um, whether it's one-to-one -one meetings, you know, uh, pastoral care meetings with either the pastor or someone who may be at a challenging point in their life. Um, and you know, there, there are a lot of situations that are in the news right now. And Amanda just wrote an article about the meeting house and in, in Bruxy. And uh, the pastoral care you know, affair is one that's common. And we cannot just keep calling it an affair because there is such a massive dynamic of power there and imbalance of power that cannot be ignored. Um, and then also elder, um, when an elder meets one-to-one, -one, maybe with someone who's older, near the end of their lives, who, who has different levels of vulnerability um, and different things come into play in that type of situation. All the more reason why I think a log could be so helpful um, for, for just transparency purposes. Um, so thanks everyone for weighing in on this. Um, on just this quickly, Eric, yeah. I noticed uh, in, the, in the chat, uh, Kathy oh. put, uh, suggest that those logs be part of regular reviews as well um, mm -hmm. as when early problems show up so that, yeah, there's, there's a, a regular check-in with what the leadership or what those who have hold positions of power in the church, how they're using their time and, and, and um, their power um, in those logs. There's sort of um, a way to kind of track with them around that and have conversations around that. So that's a really good suggestion. I will say, so Eric and Becky and I have a dream and the dream is that we would um, develop an app <laughs> for logging one-on-one -on -one meetings that you could just do it easily on your phone so that it wouldn't be cumbersome, but it would be effective for helping prevent um, situations like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right, we're going to go to the next scenario now. Here we go. A youth and a youth leader. Um, so Sarah was 15 years old and loved youth group. She was always eager to attend and invite her friends. She was extroverted and some even made fun of her for being so outgoing. The youth group itself was quite large, averaging around 30 high school students, and they always needed more adult leaders. Tom had graduated a few years earlier and, and enjoyed the time he had spent at youth group. So he volunteered and to be, a, to be a leader and quickly struck up a friendship with Sarah. Soon, Tom even began volunteering to transport Sarah back home after youth group. And she thought it was convenient, so she accepted. A few months later, Sarah refused to ever go to youth group again and seemed to cut off many relationships. She refused to talk to her parents, and eventually she started seeing a counselor. Eventually, she disclosed that Tom began to make sexual advances toward her, and she felt overwhelming guilt over having done the things she did. Yeah, the therapist had in me um, um, perks up quite a bit on this as this is just a situation that just feels very common in terms of the exploitation of children um, and teens um, by adults. And um, yeah, certainly concerning that he's um, much older than her, older than at least in the state of Iowa, that even if she would said she wanted to consent outside of the church setting, she legally wouldn't be able to because of her age. 
Um, so there's a legal matter here and then certainly a power issue within the church with him being a church leader um, and her being vulnerable to him. Um, yeah, and this, in our state, a caregiver is, um, you know, very clearly defined. I don't know if the department would get involved and in, need to get involved in the situation as I don't know if he would fit the definition of a caregiver um, in this situation, but it still might be worth a report um, to allow, you know, the state to discern if he meets that criteria. But I'm guessing they wouldn't accept it since the department's job is to um, ensure that children are safe in their homes, right? So if the parents are believing and protecting that, that they believe that this happened, um, then it would primarily be a legal matter, right? Um, that the church would hopefully cooperate with if, if there was, um, you know, a report to law enforcement. So lots of things here, but I'll let some others um, pipe in. Yeah, boy, this this story really points to the the also the spiritually corrosive effect of untended abuse in churches or just churches that aren't being vigilant about this. You realize, I mean, this is this is also like a discipleship crisis, a spiritual crisis now, right? She's disconnected from her youth group and his, her church. Will she ever be able to trust a church community again? Um, these are huge issues. So even if you want to segment, you know, these are just human issues of abuse versus the spiritual stuff that churches need to be paying attention to. I think this illustrates that that divide is pretty arbitrary. Um, that the way that we protect our vulnerable young people, especially like is a, it's a way that we also disciple them and show them what kind of community the church is called to be. And this is just such a, a striking violation of that. And there's going to be spiritual consequences for her uh, for a very long time. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, the impact of these kinds of situations plays out uh, throughout the lifetime of someone who has experienced this. Uh, I mean, this could turn Sarah off to, um, you know, church, to Christianity, to anyone who claims to hold the authority of a, of a, of a person associated with the church. Um, so it really does a significant amount of, of damage. And it strikes me that one of the things that the church needs to do in this situation is, is to convey to Sarah uh, that they take the harm done to her seriously and that they will take appropriate measures, both with Tom and uh, with um, in, in ensuring that this isn't going to happen again so that they value her. They, you know, they, um, give her every reason to believe that they believe her, they love her, they accept her. Um, and, and I think it's really important for churches to realize, like, so now Sarah is, is going to be experiencing as, you know, some trauma around this. And, um, my guess is she feels just a huge amount of shame, probably struggles with issues of self-love. And the question then becomes, how is the church going to, if she even lets them, <laughs> how can they communicate in ways that are appropriate and um, meaningful to her? So putting her needs first, um, that uh, she is loved and that they want to come alongside her in her journey toward healing. So yeah, and I think oftentimes in the situations, we forget about the parents of minors who are sometimes as equally traumatized by um, the betrayal of trust and harm to their child. And so they often need, need good care too. Um, and yeah, I always say to churches when they ask me like where to start in terms of their policies, if they haven't had a, a developed policy or they haven't yet started background checks, I always tell them that these are your high risk situations, you know, when you have, um, you know, youth group activities that are, you know, um, offer opportunities to be one-on-one -on -one with people, to share, you know, intimate conversations with people. You have, you know, adolescents really by definition interacting with each other as both leader and as a youth group attender, um, knowing their frontal lobes aren't developed. And, you know, you have a lot of, you have a lot of high risk situations here. And so um, I always think if you're going to start anywhere, start with your youth group, um, background check your leaders, you know, make sure they know your policies. Um, because those situations, yeah, with rides home and, and all of that can be so, 
so um, risky. Yeah, in fact, we recommend uh, in the Safe Church policy that uh, you include provisions around transportation and that there shouldn't be situations where uh, a church leader or a, even a volunteer leader is driving uh, any, a minor home um, in a kind of one-on-one -on -one situation. So we, we um, you know, suggest that that is not a good policy to have, um, that you do everything you can to prevent those kinds of situations um, and include those provisions in your policy. So uh, one way to prevent something like this is to make sure that, um, that no volunteer leader is driving one youth in any, you know, at any time. One thing I, I noticed about this is it wasn't to her parents or to the church that she initially disclosed, it was to a counselor. And uh, one trend that I've been noticing that seems pretty positive to me, there's a lot of Christian Reformed churches I'm hearing about, at least in Ontario, Michigan, I think in Iowa as well, that are signing up for these uh, EAPs mm -hmm. uh, or CAP programs where uh, essentially the church sort of makes a contract with a provider, a mental health care provider. Um, where counseling is free or enormously subsidized. That's just a signal to a church that like, this is a good thing. And um, even when Tara mentioned like the trauma to the parents, like to be able to say, yeah, you're going to need somebody, a professional to talk, talk to about this. And as a church, we value that. We want to encourage that. It's a kind of signal you can give institutionally that that's okay. And it may have been something in this case that helped to unlock this case to get toward mo movement is that it was okay for her to see a counselor. There's a couple of questions in the chat or comments in the chat that maybe we could. Um, Faye talked about how laws differing for mandatory reporting in the state. So yeah, I always say when in doubt, just report it. The, you know, the worst thing they're gonna say is this doesn't meet our definition. And they forward it to the what we call the county attorney's office or the district attorney's office. So, you know, when in doubt, just report. Um, if it doesn't meet the criteria, it'll, um, you know, they'll say it doesn't meet criteria. If it does, then they'll just make sure people are safe. And um, yeah. yeah, yeah, the mandatory reporting. You know, that's um, it's it's unique to to the U.S. Every citizen in Canada is a mandatory reporter. And, oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um, and I've, I've also encouraged churches to put in their policy that it's not just certain people who are mandatory reporters, but every one of us as members of this church, um, by signing this policy and agreeing to be a leader, you're also agreeing to be a mandatory reporter um, because it creates uh, more of a, an expectation that we take this seriously and we're going to ensure that we're going to go forward in the best possible way um, if something happens. Um, I I would add to that. Yeah. Sorry, Eric, I just want to add to that. So the new code of conduct includes mandatory reporting in it. And um, that uh, all office bearers and all ministry leaders, ordained ministry leaders are going to be asked to sign that um, code of conduct. So they will become mandatory reporters in our denomination. But there's also um, an encouragement that all um, staff and all volunteers be asked to sign this code of conduct, right? So you can include that in your safe church policy as well, that all your, your volunteer and paid staff are going to sign this code of conduct, which makes them mandatory reporters. So thank you, because I think legally in the state of Iowa, um, our pastors aren't. So it'd be great if our denomination could, could assert right. that. Right. So it raises the bar, right? We're saying as a denomination, uh, we recognize that there's a, the law of the land, but then <laughs> we want to go above and beyond the law of the land, right? To exhibit um, the, the faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So. Yeah. Um, just a few other items about this scenario. Um, one is, I think sometimes we struggle with language. We don't, this scenario doesn't pinpoint exactly what did happen between Tom and Sarah. Um, but I wouldn't hesitate to, you know, call this for what it is illegally statutory rape. Um, 
And we often, for minors, use language around, oh, they had they had sex with this person who was older, but it, it wasn't just that. We, we, we really need to be true to um, what did happen, especially with such a power differential and, um, and not minimize it by calling it for something that it's not. Um, and also that this kind of thing, uh, it's really difficult for churches to navigate um, because they can't share you know, uh, who the individual was or identifying information with the youth group, with the church community. So it, it's really hard for a church community to move forward knowing you know, through hearsay of some things that have happened, but not being able to talk um, in a way that, or, or even hear what, what actually went on. And so this type of situation just causes a lot of challenges um, for the whole congregation and the whole community. Um, uh, we're, I think we're, we're running out of time. We, we love all the, the different conversation and I see some more in the chat. Um, you know, I, I'm just gonna acknowledge Kathy's comment um, about confidenti co confidentiality being hard and how can the church deal with that? Um, and I, I'll post that over to our panel. Um, any ideas about how churches can go forward um, in confidence over some of the situations that, that come up and, and to still respond well with justice and compassion? Well, one, one thing that comes to mind with this and the, and the previous case, I think um, suspending somebody from ministry work without prejudice is a tool that every church has in their toolkit and is just use it. Um, uh, part of what I, I mean, in some ways, these cases are artificial. They're meant to fit on a page. I could imagine this scenario being more like a, a slow leak, like you sort of get a sense maybe something wasn't right. And then it's sort of, comp oh, it, more details get fleshed in. As soon as you get those first signals that something's not right, like your obligation is to protect the most vulnerable. Um, and so to be able to suspend somebody without prejudice and just say, hey, we got to get we're, we're working to get to the bottom of something uh, creates a space where that um, can get can get developed um, without having to name names and again what you're signaling to to whomever finds out about that is listen we take we take anything like this seriously um, we want to um, we're extremely responsive when concerns arise I often advocate for a restorative um, process, and I think some restorative processes can be done with those who are trusted leaders who already are in the know about some things. And often something comes up and they have no way to actually talk about it and process and learn together and figure out ways to go forward that is really dignifying for each person. And so working through a process like that with a council, with other staff members, with other leaders who are on the team trying to both support the person who has come forward um, and also ensure that um, there is an appropriate amount of discipline or, or justice done um, for the person who has uh, abused their power. Um, so that's one way to also, I think, still keep con confidentiality, um, yet create spaces for people to, to acknowledge what's, what's been going on or what did happen. Um, we're going to move on to the next scenario. New pastor in old situations of abuse. So Pastor Steve was a month into his position as pastor, and it was then that allegations of sexual misconduct were made against a former worship director and against the church for negligence for a situation that happened 18 years ago. The man who was raising the allegation was now 32 and was 14 at the time. The church and the council didn't know how to respond. Several members of council didn't know the person who was raising allegation or his family, and Pastor Steve and the council chose not to make a decision on the matter, hoping that they could make a better decision once things settled down. After a month, an investigator from law enforcement then began asking questions of the council and said an investigation had been opened. Um, observations, um, the things that people have for this. Yeah, I think um, the fact that law enforcement is now involved will probably um, alert them that this is a serious matter and 
and maybe convict them of their of their sitting on it or their their hope to sit on it. Um, but I guess yeah, my my thoughts go immediately to to the victim to validate you know the victim and to um, express concern for what happened. And I think the reaction often is, well, that didn't happen under our care or I didn't know about it. So I couldn't do anything about it, you know, and, um, but that just really isn't helpful in helping victims move forward with their healing is, um, to just say, you know, well, if I was here, we would have had this policy or we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have allowed that. So, um, I guess it's a dangerous situation for churches to ignore things that they view they weren't responsible for when really, um, the hope is to repair that relationship with, with the church as a whole. Um, yeah, so I would, you know, take care of him and, um, yeah, hopefully demonstrate policies in place from this point moving forward that, you know, it won't happen again. So. Yeah, boy, I noticed the delay. That's the big thing screaming at me. And I totally get it. Like you're a new pastor on scene. This comes up. This is not at all what you expected you'd be dealing with. But I also think this is one of the best things about being a part of a denomination. Like, I, I feel like no church is, has any excuse when it's like, well, you got, you've got safe church coordinators, you got safe church ministries. I totally understand being uncertain what to do. There's some complexifying features of this where you'd say, I, this isn't as clear cut as I thought it was. What do I do? Um, we've got really responsive safe church ministry folks on this call um, uh, that leave you without excuse. So you don't have to not know. Um, and I think that's, again, one of the best things about being a part of a denomination. Yeah. Um let me just add to that. I think once law enforcement gets involved and there's a, a, an investigation, it's really important that the church cooperates with law enforcement in that investigation. And um, it gets really complicated because if you reach out to the alleged victim at that point, um, you can actually taint the investigation. So you have to be careful about the kinds of conversations you have. And so I, one recommendation that was made to me was um, uh, to reach out to the victim's advocate and um, that you could communicate as a church to the victim's advocate instead of directly to the victim. Um, what you could do is, is send a note to just say, you know, we're cooperating with the authorities and, and we want you to know once the investigation is done, we'd like to be in further conversation. But um, just to recognize, you need to give that space to the authorities to do their work. I think another really important uh, note it, that sort of comes to mind as I read through this situation is to be aware of laws around statute of limitations. Um, in Canada, there are no statute of limitations on um, cases of sexual assault. And so you can bring criminal charges um, years after the event has happened. In the United States, every state is different, um, but many states are lifting their statute of limitations. And um, especially for filing a civil suit against the perpetrator. And you cannot just file a civil suit against the perpetrator, but against anyone who uh, created the space for that perpetrator to commit that um, assault. And so uh, churches could find themselves at the <laughs> unfortunate end of a civil suit um, because they haven't done due diligence with duty of care. And so just to be aware of that, that it, the whole uh, tide is changing in terms of people's attitude toward abuse. There's less and less tolerance for it and more and more regulations around um, um, attending to uh, situations of abuse in favor of the survivor or the victim, which is a good thing, right? And we as a church want to be um, part of the, the goodness of that <laughs> effort, so... Yeah, and I think the response really sets the precedent for others in the church to view their church as a safe church, right? So like if there's 
and there likely are other people in the church who have been harmed, whether it was by a church leader or not. Uh, the church is a role model in the situation of saying, you know, this is how serious we take this. And, um, you know, this is what God's word says about, um, you know, caring for these people and, um, yeah, just being uh, justice seekers in the situation. So I, I always think about that too. Um, you know, even with the issue at hand, it's a bigger issue in terms of the church feeling like a safe place for everybody else. Yeah, as much as this might feel like a distraction at the start of someone's ministry, there's also an opportunity here to to establish like what kind of culture you're going to create. Uh, and that could be part of this. I mean, obviously, the pastor and the council are working together on this, but um, that's a great shift to signal to your congregation um, that we we take this seriously. Yeah, and I, I noticed in the comments, there was a comment about it may not be in the pastor's control, and that's true, but the pastor does have a voice uh, to be able to say and lead the council in saying, this is an important issue, and we need to um, we need to attend to this, and so let's reach out to Safe Church uh, Ministry, or let's reach out to our Safe Church Coordinator and find out what is the best course of action. I'll acknowledge Natasha's comment as well, which I think is a great um, word from her experience with Plan to Protect uh, to both, as soon as something comes up, um, to provide assurance that you've heard them, um, that they take it seriously, and that they encourage counseling and support, um, and without admitting fault, uh, to, to, to share it with law enforcement should they choose. Um, and, and yeah, insurance providers and legal counsel are always helpful. Um, I just had a, a conversation with Brotherhood Mutual, which is a, an insurance provider in the US and they offer both legal aid and, um, and conversations once something has come up and we encourage you to reach out to your insurance provider as soon as you hear something um, has happened or an allegation is brought forward um, as well. Uh, we are uh, quickly running near the end of our time. And uh, I, I appreciate um, each of you for participating through the chat and comments and appreciate Sean and Tara and Amanda's um, role on this panel as we've continued to learn from some of these hypothetical situations, um, yet how similar situations have impacted our communities and churches. And so uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda and she's going to introduce more of the Safe Church Assessment Tool. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, before I introduce that, I just want to acknowledge that there are questions in the chat that we didn't get to. And um, to say, if, if you are in a situation right now or your church is in a situation where you're dealing with a, an allegation of abuse and you have concerns or questions about how to handle that, do not hesitate to reach out to Safe Church. Um, I noticed one of the questions is how would you handle notifications to the congregation? And, and we have um, worked with Safe Church coordinators and Safe Church leads in churches um, to craft language about how, how to do that well in a way that honors the dignity and the privacy of the victim, while at the same time giving enough information and directing the conversation, the congregation in a way that um, sort of invites them to be prayerful about this rather than um, all the other ways in which congregations can receive information like this. So um, yeah, don't hesitate to reach out to Safe Church. We'd be happy to help. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to host this webinar is because we're launching a new tool uh, from Safe Church Ministry. It's called the Safe Church Assessment. And one of the reasons to develop the tool was we realized sometimes churches don't really know where to begin uh, when they're thinking about how do we make our churches safer? Uh, they're not quite sure where to start either because they've got some things in place and um, they seem to be working okay, but they don't really know, or they haven't got anything in place and they just, it seems like a huge mountain to climb uh, to, to do all the things that are required to make their church safe. And so 
uh, we put together this assessment tool, which is um, really just a list. It's a survey. It's a list of questions that cover um, a variety of topics, including um, policy and training and um, questions about the physical building. Uh, the questions cover issues around uh, whether the church, um, whether there's good awareness among the leadership around abuse and what that looks like. And does the church feel like a safe place where um, those who have been victimized by abuse will um, find healing and um, comfort? Um, does, does the church feel like a place where if they brought forward allegations of abuse, it would be responded to well? Um, there are questions in the assessment about church culture, so around issues of accountability and healthy boundaries and the conduct, particularly of leaders. And then there's, um, if you want to go the distance, there's the optional section on um, issues around diversity and inclusion. How hospitable is your church to those who may not be part of the dominant culture? And then there's a section on financial matters. How safe is your church with respect to how it handles finances? And so the idea is that a council could decide, um, perhaps in conversation with the safe church representative in their congregation, that they want to assess the safety and health of their congregation. And so uh, they uh, take this survey tool and perhaps they do it just among the council and some staff persons, but ideally you would actually distribute the survey to a good cross section of the church, uh, of the congregation. So you would get some good feedback, not just on what is, but how others perceive or experience the church and the health and safety of the church. Um, and then once you uh, have people, um, you know, distribute the survey and you perhaps give them two weeks to respond and then you get all the survey results back and that gives you data, right? From which to then reflect on where are we strong and where do we need to grow? And what I like to do is encourage churches who use the tool to then contact uh, their safe church coordinator, their classes safe church coordinator, who can come in and have a conversation with them about the results of the survey and then make some recommendations about some things that they might do to make their churches safer and healthier. So the idea is just really to, again, equip uh, churches with a tool that will help them assess the safety and health of their congregations and also invite them uh, to engage in conversation with those who have some experience and um, knowledge about safe church matters, uh, who can help them really think hard about the safety and health of their congregations. So um, yeah, you can find that on our website. And I think there's a link in the uh, chat about the Safe Church Assessment Tool. Um, there's a network article on it that you can read more about it. But, um, and yeah, so if any of you are interested in using this, it's still a little bit in a pilot phase, but um, we'd be happy to have further conversations with you about how to use this tool well. All right, thanks, Amanda. Uh, we have about six or seven minutes uh, before we wrap up. And so if anyone has any specific question for, for us, Safe Church, or one of our panelists, um, we have a little bit of time to acknowledge those now. Looks like, um, yeah, we, so the, the Google form, um, and we also can probably figure out a way to create a hard copy of the assessment as well, um, as Jody asked the question in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we can just make a note to follow up with you, Jody, after the webinar. There is actually a hard copy that we can, we can, or, or we can actually send you, um, 
uh, we can send you the Google form and you can just go through it yourself and see if it's something that would be helpful for your for your congregation or your classes. Um, in terms of the rollout for the code of conduct, so there's a proposal that's going to synod this year. Um, so that would be June that makes uh, an amendment to the church order to include uh, the code of conduct as one of the things that office bearers are going to be asked to sign alongside of the covenant of office bearers. And so uh, we're really hoping that Synod affirms and approves that proposal. There's other pieces to the proposal as well, but that's that's the primary, the center, center piece of the proposal for implementing the code of conduct. And so, you know, when, when classes gather, they have um, each of the delegates sign the covenant of office bearers if they're being seated for the first time. And so now they would be also asked to, to sign the code of conduct. I also saw another question about um, a list of attorneys um, that could work alongside of congregations. Uh, and that's something that um, we're working on. It's, we're, we're a very spread out um, denomination throughout North America, US and Canada. And there are um, a host of people who, and so we refer, you know, some, some people are working locally, but also some organizations who are trained and have an emphasis on abuse prevention, also have legal teams. Um, and so we often refer some of those organizations. One of them is uh, Plan to Protect. I believe they have a legal team and may actually do an independent investigation. Um, there's also Ministry Safe, which is a Texas-based organization. Um, and actually two attorneys lead that organization. And uh, Grace, godly response to abuse in a Christian environment also has a legal team associated with them and um, are on staff with their organization. And so those are some bigger organization which take uh, especially those who've been affected by abuse and survivor of survivor focus um, to and also um, just really great um, ways of working with Christian institutions and congregations. Um, and, and they each of them do a really good job. Um, but we're always looking for more people who uh, have a really great um, experience in this and especially in the legal field. Um, and so other questions that we see in the chat. Yeah, I can take the one by Tanya um, about the, the uh, safe church assessment tool. So one of the things that we have done, we put it in a Google form. And so if a church is gonna use it, they actually need to copy the Google form and um, so, so that the responses come to them. So they have to take ownership of the doc and we're trying to figure out an easy way to make that happen. So you still actually need to contact us uh, really to, to um, so that we can hand it off to a church uh, so that they, so that the responses don't come to us. They come to the church uh, council and the church leadership themselves. Um, but yeah, again, if you're interested in it, we're happy to, um, to uh, find ways to distribute it to all who are interested in using it. Um, just a quick response to Liz's question about uh, would all current council members sign the code of conduct? And yes, I think the idea is that every uh, council member from here going forward, post June, if this gets approved by Synod, would sign the code of conduct. All right. Um, well, I, I've appreciated this conversation and uh, learning along with each of our panelists here today. And I'll also highlight uh, our Abuse Awareness Sunday topic for the year of 2022, which happens on the fourth Sunday of September. Uh, and that's a time when we encourage all congregations to partake in uh, a Sunday service and of worship focused on um, raising awareness of abuse and, and preaching against abuse. And so um, we also encourage churches, if you already have a sermon series set well into September, 
then any Sunday throughout the year is also a good time to, to focus on abuse prevention and abuse awareness. And so with that being said, I'm going to share in the chat uh, a link over to the worship resources that we have available for the year of 2022, which is all on the topic of back to the basics for um, the, or the safe church basics. And so we're walking through each of the five steps to make your church safer through these webinars, and it will lead um, up to Abuse Awareness Sunday, and, uh, and we're looking forward to continuing to um, host these webinar series, and specifically for the next webinar, um, to be on uh, making and revising policy. And so um, with that being said, I will also quickly share the, um, the bulletin insert that we have that's available for for congregations, and that's in the chat. And I'll say I'm I'm particularly um, glad for this because we use the artwork again by um, an artist, a textile artist based in Ontario who does textile art, and we just think her artwork is so beautiful. And so um, I'm going to share the screen now to to share the bulletin insert that can be used by any congregation. Um, and so five steps to a safer church. And then we have on the back side um, each of our webinars and each step that we are highlighting for 2022, assess risk, make and revise policy, screen and train leaders and volunteers, practice being restorative and responding to abuse with justice and compassion. Um, and as we wrap up, I just want to close in prayer. Please join me in prayer. So triune God, uh, we thank you that you are the author, creator, and the sustainer of this entire world. And um, we thank you that you have made each one of us in your image. Um, and we thank you for this good work that we are called to as your church to go forward um, making disciples um, and to make known your gospel and your good news and to do so in ways that are so dignifying to to each of your image bearers. And so we lament and grieve when abuse does happen in our communities. Um, and we pray that this time was a time of learning that each of us could go forward to, to both um, raise awareness of how abuse affects um, people, especially those who are vulnerable and how it affects each of us as the church. And so we pray that you continue to go before us and provide all that we stand in need of so that we can be ready um, when we uh, have to respond to, to abuse and that we are able to do it with a deep level of compassion and also in a way that is just. And so it's in your name that we pray, Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks again, everyone. Farewell.